The presidential candidate for Bolivia's movement towards socialism has blamed the facto authorities for the uncontrolled spread of wildfires in one of the country's main nature reserves. Students have returned to school in Milan, Italy, amid the strict safety measures against COVID-19. Kenya is set to begin trials of a COVID-19 vaccine developed by a British company in partnership with Oxford University. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south, I'm Laura Palmeiro. And we begin in Bolivia, where the presidential candidate for the movement towards socialism, Luis Arce, has directly blamed the de facto authorities for the uncontrolled spread of the wildfires in the Noel Kempf Mercado National Park, one of the country's main nature reserves. If we were in government, what would the scandals in the media be like, as happened in 2019, right? Today, those photos, the videos are not even being shown on social media. This has really caught our attention. It is an issue that concerns us. It is an issue that we were in the government, the super tanker to solve the problem, as we did in 2019. But this government is not concerned about it. This government has distanced itself from responsibility. And we basically see the people of the governor's office of Santa Cruz trying to avoid more fires, but it is insufficient. And more than 20 wildfires have been reported in the National Park northeast of Bolivia Santa Cruz Department. According to the Ministry of the Environment and Water, the fires have so far consumed nearly 500,000 hectares of land across the park. Authorities also announced that an emergency meeting will be held on Wednesday to evaluate the situation. Sector Minister Maria Elva Pinkert also announced that ministry forces are being deployed to locate the path out the fires. The de facto government declared a red alert and the Ministry of Defense explained that if necessary, water bombing operations will be carried out with a group of eight tankers. The Secretary of the Environment and Sustainable Development informed of a difficult situation in various municipalities due to the weather conditions, including high temperatures and strong winds. Authorities of the Brazilian state of South Mato Grosso declared an emergency situation after at least 1.5 million hectares of the Pantanal National Park were affected by fires, three times as stronger than 2019. A spokesman for the fire department of Mato Grosso said that these fires are caused by logging, mining and agricultural operations, among other illegal practices. The largest wetland in South America, known as Pantanal, rich in diversity of flora and fauna, includes 159 species of mammals in danger of extinction. Firefighters, along with environmental ministry officials, are working in rescue operations and to animals to wildlife refugees. In Brazil, the section of the prosecutor's office investigating the Lava Jato case has announced one accused of former President Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva of money laundering, this time on the basis of alleged illegal donations. According to the former president's defense team, the accusation by the Federal Public Prosecutor's Office of Paraná aims to criminalize four legal donations made by construction giant Odebrecht to the Lula Institute NGO between 2013 and 2014, thus confusing the legal entity status of the institute with the individual condition of former president. According to the prosecutor's branch in charge of the Lava Jato case, Odebrecht's contributions were covered up. However, according to the defense, these contributions were delayed accounting for publicity and accordance with the relevant laws. The accusation, which refers to the alleged concealment of $760,000, also includes former finance minister Antonio Paloshi and the former president of the Lula Institute, Paolo Okamato. Several students and teachers' movements protested in Ecuador this Monday in rejection of the budget cost to the education sector promoted by the Lenin Moreno government. The measures to cut funds was approved last week by the Constitutional Court and condemned by both students and education workers' unions.
The Federation of University Students of Ecuador denounced that more than $92 million are to be cut from the budget. Students warned that the measure puts approximately 300,000 young university students at risk and that some degree courses such as medicine and art will be removed this semester. They also stressed that they would remain mobilized and on the streets until an agreement is reached with the government that responds to the interests of both the student and the teaching community. This Monday, Peruvian President Martin Vizcarra commented on leaked audio tapes linking him with a corruption case. The president is facing an impeachment vote in Congress this week after recordings revealed he had encouraged his aides to lie to investigators. In recent hours, interested sectors have circulated and handed over to the media a set of audios and all these materials must be accordingly corroborated and investigated by the public ministry. I must tell Peruvians that what it is happening here is betrayal by someone in my closest circle. Likewise, President Vizcarra claimed that the current controversy was a personal situation that is being used against him in the political context. This is a situation of a private nature that has moved into the political sphere and has been taking advantage of my dark characters. I have to deeply regret and apologize to the country because an individual at the presidential office in whom I trusted, not now but years ago, has generated this situation without basis and without any grounds and which feeds the gossip and the curiosity of many people. And we'll be right back after this very short break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. At least 35 people have been killed, including a child in Washington state, as a result of wildfires ravaging the west coast of the United States. Over 3.2 million acres of land have already been burned. Authorities in California state noted that over 16,000 firefighters have been battling 28 major wildfires, which have left 24 people dead and more than 4,000 structures destroyed. Meanwhile, California Governor Gavin Newsom, Los Angeles City Mayor Eric Garcetti, together with the Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden, have attributed the intensity of this season's fires to climate change. Thus, contradicting statements by U.S. President Donald Trump, who claimed poor forest management by western states was the main cause of the fires. Meanwhile, weather conditions are not expected to improve anytime soon, as high winds of up to 40 miles per hour are forecast in the coming days in parts of California. President Trump visited McCollin Park, located in Northern California, on Monday for a meeting with local and federal fire and emergency officials tackling the blazes. Students have returned to school in Milan, Italy, amid the strict safety measures against COVID-19. Millions of Italian children returned to the classrooms on Monday as mass schools reopened more than six months after they were closed to curb the coronavirus pandemic. In class, the teachers, the students and employees must wear masks and maintain a safe distance. The school officially restarted on September 14, 2020. Each school has been occupied to make its environment as safe as possible. Parents are asked to bring backpack with a change, bottle of water and slippers and will be provided with a bag to contain the shoes with which you arrive at school and which should not be used in the classroom. We are living in an exceptional situation, never seen before. Small sacrifice, such as keeping the mask on for a few days or staying at home one day a week to do distance learning, are acceptable compromises to ensure the return of students to school. Italy was the first in Europe to close schools and the last to reopen them. For this reason, we are very cautious. The greatest discomfort is perhaps having to keep the mask for many hours and also not being able to do school normally. We cannot have a break and go out in the hallway to see our friends. 
A deputy mayor of the French capital Paris resigned Monday after allegations of sexual harassment leveled by a co-worker just weeks after another deputy mayor stepped down amid protests over his links to a non-pedophile. The city council announced that Pierre Aiden Baum, aged 78, had tendered his resignation just over two months after he was appointed deputy mayor responsible for the Seine River that flows through the French capital. The allegations against the official were immediately reported to the public prosecutor. The council said in a statement, Hayden Baum had served as mayor of Paris, a third administrative district, for a quarter of a century. His resignation comes after another deputy to mayor, Christophe Rigard, resigned from his post in July after opposition politicians and women's groups demanded his suspension over ties to Gabriel Matzneff, an award-winning writer who was never hiding his his preference for sex with adolescent girls and boys. This Monday, Austrian authorities confirmed a second surge in COVID-19 cases across the country. The total number of cases reported now stands at over 33,000. What we are experiencing right now is the beginning of a second wave in Austria. We have rapidly rising infection numbers. Two weeks ago, we used to have 350 daily infections in Austria, and yesterday we already had over 850 infections. Around 50% of all new infections are in Vienna. We are especially affected here, but all over Austria the infection numbers are rising. Therefore, it is absolutely essential that the measures decided on by the government must be observed. And following an official visit to Germany on Monday, the Iraqi foreign minister confirmed that a sixth ten of remains of the Islamic State terror group in Iraq and Syria, calling for international support to tackle them. It raises <coughs> itself is, are there still terrorist units belonging to Syria? The answer is yes. The question that raises itself, has the Islamic State begun to rebuild itself? The question is yes. And the last question that raises itself, is do we need international support in the fields I mentioned? The answer is yes. In this context, the, question that the stabilization of the areas in Iraq exempted from the IS is of particular concern to us, and that is a large part of our work, also in the civil sector, and I believe that this is the essential prerequisite of answering questions of sovereignty in a way that is in the interest of the Iraqi people, and we are also in talks with our French friends on how President Macron's initiative can be sensibly combined with all the initiatives that exist and those also supported. This Monday, the lower house of the UK Parliament passed the Internal Market Bill in its second reading, which contains norms that override the withdrawal agreement signed with the European Union. The bill was approved by a majority of 77 in a vote of 340 against favour, against 263. Although the British government has acknowledged that the bill breaches the legally binding Brexit agreement and international law, the move has been described by Prime Minister Boris Johnson as an insurance policy aimed at preventing a foreign power from dividing the UK by using Northern Ireland protocols as leverage in ongoing trade talks. Meanwhile, the EU has demanded that UK authorities rule out parts of the bill that go against the deal by the end of September, while threatening not to sign a final long-term trade agreement. And we have more news coming up after this final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. Kenya is set to begin trials of a COVID-19 vaccine developed by a British company in partnership with Oxford University. The trials will target hundreds of health workers who are on the front line in the battle against COVID-19. These are the people that will be among the first participants in Kenya to take part in clinical trials for a COVID-19 vaccine being developed by AstraZeneca in partnership with Oxford University. With more than 1.3 million COVID-19 cases and close to 32,000 dead, there has been a concerted push by African countries for access to a vaccine once it is available. 
The World Health Organization said international donors have so far raised 700 million U.S. dollars to purchase vaccines for poor countries. Having a local group participate in these studies will help inform whether this vaccine is for us, does it require any modification, is it going to do harm. In step one and step two they are looking to see whether it is safe and secondly whether it is going to create the resistance that we are looking for or what you call immunogenicity. Having a local... <laughs> Authorities in the Indonesian capital Jakarta reimposed a partial coronavirus lockdown on Monday and vowed to strictly isolate anyone testing positive for COVID-19 as infection soared. The country is the hardest hit in Southeast Asia by the coronavirus pandemic, having confirmed over 220,000 infections and more than 8,800 deaths. The policy to reimpose partial lockdown is actually good but I can't stop trading at the market. If I'm not working, I wouldn't have money. If I don't have money, what would I eat? Trading is my source of income, but I will implement the health protocol. People should learn from this. When the lockdown is reimposed, stop gathering. With this being reimposed, people should be deterred. Most of the infected people at the isolation center are not from this area, mostly from Raba Malaka, Jembatan Besi, and Kiliangyar. We have to accept the center here. We are in crisis and we have to follow the policy. Tanzanian and Ugandan authorities have signed an agreement to develop an oil pipeline project in the East African region. Meanwhile, environmental conservation groups have claimed the construction of the pipeline threatens livelihoods and fragile ecosystems in the area. This project is another great victory for our nation. We have written another history of victory with Uganda. The first was that of the Kagera War, whereby we overthrew Idi Amin and he fled Uganda. That was our first victory. This one now is our second historical victory in economic terms, and this victory is for both sides, Tanzania and Uganda. 4.6 billion is officially the total amount of fuel that has been confirmed. This amount is found in areas in which 30% of the oil areas is found. The remaining 6.5 billion is in the Albertine zone, but it's only 40% of the area. We are still searching the remaining area to find more fuel. And protests continue in Algeria's capital, Algiers, on Monday to demand the release of independent journalist Khaled Drareni, who was sentenced to three years in prison for incitement to UN armed gathering, following his coverage of anti-government protests that broke out across the country in February last year. We really hope that tomorrow it will be the very day of deliverance, and in any case we want to stop. It is not only Khaled who is detained today. I think of Mohamed Tatyajid, the poet of Iraq. I think of Balid Kechida, who has been in prison for months for a meme, who has not even been judged today. It is all these manipulations that we have come to denounce, and solidarity is an obligation. It is important to continue the mobilization. It is important to continue, including media pressure, both on the judicial authorities but also the political authorities, so that they understand that we will not give up, whether journalists or citizens will not give up on the issue of the release of the detainees. Today we are trying to send a message to the authorities. We want to show that we support the journalist and colleague Khaled Dradeni, because he only did his job. The facts cited in his file are related to Khaled's work as a journalist in the field and it is not a crime. Ivory Coast Constitutional Council has blocked a former president and a former prime minister from contesting the country's presidential elections set for October 31st. Former Prime Minister and rebel leader Guillaume Soto was nominated by the Generations and People in Solidarity Party on Sunday. But the Electoral Commission has barred him as he was sentenced to 20 years in prison in April for concealment and embezzlement of public funds. Meanwhile, former President Lorraine de Gebarbo 
well, who refused to recognize the victory of current President Alassane Outarra in the 2010 election, was also sentenced to 20 years in prison in absentia last year for the looting of the local branch of the Central Bank of West African states. Meanwhile, the country's main opposition party, the Democratic Party of Côte d'Ivoire, African Democratic Rally, has nominated Henri Conan Bédier, who has hosted in the country's first cup since independence in 1999. The candidacy file of Mr. Bagbo Laron doesn't comply with the provisions of Article 48, 50, and 51 of the Electoral Code and must therefore be declared inadmissible. The candidacy of Mr. Soro Kibafori Gijom is declared inadmissible. The candidacy file of Mr. Bagbo Laron doesn't comply with the provisions of Article 48, 50, and 51 of the Electoral Code and must therefore be declared inadmissible. The candidacy of Mr. Soro Kibafori Gijom is declared inadmissible. And with that, we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Laura Palmeiro. Thank you for watching.